from the prehistoric period, we find lots and lots of burials um, in which many, many pots are in there. They may have been meant to contain burial offerings. They may have been the offerings themselves in many cases. Um, whether it's in Nyangan in Myanmar or in Banadi, Thailand. Many, many pots are often included in the prehistoric era. And so the, now it's been argued by Charles Hyam and others who worked on this that the number of pots may be proportionate to the social status of the person being buried, but we can't be sure of that because it doesn't seem to work out in every case. Like sometimes you get young children also with lots of pots. Does that mean that they were from real kind of rich families? Or just what was the implication of the pot? We cannot um, impose kind of modern ideas about the importance of numbers of artifacts um, on these ancient burials. But it is one indicator, no doubt. There is something going on here. We can only make analogies to the more recent periods to try and understand the importance of these pots in the burial sites. And we do know it was somehow symbolic of some kind of social status. Ethnoarchaeology is a field which has kind of waxed and waned in terms of its popularity. When I was teaching at Dajabada University back in the 1980s, um, there were many, many students did their honors theses on ethnoarchaeology, going around studying pottery, how pottery was made, how it was used in modern traditional societies in Indonesia. And um, that might have been like 30% of the honor species being done in those days. And now I think it's been almost totally replaced by cultural resource management studies. People much more interested in how, how do we um, preserve sites, preserve um, um, artifacts, and how do we make money off it for tourism. That's much more economically viable to do cultural resource management than this to ethnoarchaeology. So ethnoarchaeology has kind of declined in popularity among students and among scholars in general. And I think it's important, though. It's uh, very unfortunate that it's not so widely studied as today. Um, anyway, this is one study I did in Sumatra back in the 1980s. Uh, and you'll see here that uh, it's a woman potter. And this, for a long time, has been the situation that pottery has mainly been a woman's occupation. Here we have Borbudur again, 9th century. Here we have the women sitting on the ground making the pots with the same basic implements that the modern Sumatra women are still using. So here we have the men in the background carrying the clay from the, where they dug it up and bringing it to the women who are sitting on the ground and they've got the same kind of paddle and anvil that you so see with the modern Sumatra woman. And then in the next relief to that, you have this uh, depiction of the pots then putting put into some kind of a structure, probably for drying, before they're being fired. In most modern societies, especially rural societies, pottery is a woman's craft. Um, we can't be sure that this is always the case in prehistoric times, but it seems quite logical. So this is one all a good way of looking at possible sexual division of labor in ancient societies. We can't be sure that all the pots we will find are made by women, but it's highly probable based on ethnoarchaeological data. Now, technology, another way of studying pottery, in addition to its artistic, its stylistic attributes and its symbolic qualities, is to look at it from a purely technological point of view. It is one of the most important early forms of pyro technology, use of fire to transform, transform a natural material. Um, a lot of information about pottery can, and culture and technology can be obtained by just looking at the materials a pot is made from. And you can do this just often with a little handheld microscope. You don't need a lot of sophisticated equipment to do it, although certainly it helps. And uh, the basic materials are just of uh, two types. One is clay. That's the basic material, which chemically is aluminum silicate hydroxide. And um, it's a very common material in nature, but it's very rare to find it in a pure, uncontaminated uh, form. It's a, you find it in sedimentary sites near rivers, near lakes, near uh, streams. But usually it's mixed up with other materials besides just pure clay. Um, and these are called inclusions. Um, and there are two types of inclusions. Something's included in the clay. 
and these can be either natural, which are there just because it got mixed up because of deposition by water, or it can be intentionally added by the potters. Potters actually do mix in other objects, other materials with clay for specific technological reasons. It has to do with making sure the texture of the pot is uniform throughout, and it also can be used to ensure that the clay will dry quickly. Usually when you make a pot, of course, you need it to mix the clay with water so it can be easily formed. But then you want to get rid of all the water. If there's any water in a pot, when you go to the next stage, which is firing, the, the water inside the clay will start to boil and it will expand and it will explode and your pot will get broken. So that's why drying is very important. That's why you need often to have some kind of more coarse material inside the pot. And we call this temper. That's the next word on the outline, temper. It's called tempering the pot. It's like tempering a piece of steel. Like we call it, talk about the blacksmith tempering the metal. We also call it, talk about tempering the pot, making it more resistant to heat. And these, these can be organic, like, like using rice chaff. A lot of early studies of agriculture use the, the rice chaff inside a pot as evidence of early rice domestication, for example. It can be shells. Um, it can be lots of other organic materials. Also, it can be inorganic, and sand is the most common. Uh, it can be ground up pottery. <laughs> Broken pots, you can grind it up and put that in, and that's called grog, technical term. So, uh, the temper is usually a very useful source of data for the archaeologist, what is inside of it. Because uh, the, the clay is almost basically the same material around the world, whereas the temper can be of many different types, and often people will go to great distances to get it. This is a boat in eastern Indonesia, in the Irianjaya area. And these are potters coming back from voyaging to another island about 60 or 70 kilometers away. They would go that far just to get the proper temper and mix in with the clay. They've got clay. But temp proper temper is usually imported from elsewhere. So it's a very useful, useful thing when you're studying where did the pottery actually come from. But often, the things inside of it are not all locally obtained. They can be brought in from distance. OK, so that's one thing, the basic material itself, the clay and the temper. And the next material is what you put on the surface to decorate. And one of the most cop popular and common coatings for pottery today is glass. We call it glaze, but it's actually just glass. It's the same thing as the water glass here. And the glaze, glaze is just this. It's clay. I mean, it's a silicon. But it's stuck to the surface of the pot. And so in a pure form, it has no color. Here, this is an eastern Borneo, or western Borneo. This is a, a folk potter there, um, mixing up glaze to put on. Just get rid of that. OK. This is glazing. You can see it's grayish color here, but when it's fired, it will usually turn translucent, transparent, but no color. So all the colors in pots are additional materials again. Like to make blue and white pottery, you need to add cobalt and so forth. So uh, now until about, say, 1,000, 1,200 years ago, the Chinese were the only people in the world using this technology. China developed this very early in its history. Europeans only learned how to do it in about 250 years ago. Um, so glazing was a Chinese adaptation, innovation, and the Southeast Asians were the second group in the world to begin doing this. We don't know exactly when, but it seems like this site we're going to work on, so yeah, may be one of the oldest. We have a date of about 500, um, 500 common era, CE from the Tomiak site. Now whether it's connected, it seems to be connected with earthen layer production, not glazing yet. At some point in Tomiak, they began to make glazed ceramics, but we don't know when. It would be very useful to know whether it actually appeared shortly after the Tomiak site was first occupied, around the 5th century, um, or whether it was a much later development at that site, we just don't know. So that's one of the major questions that the Tomiak site might actually be able to solve. It's not just chosen at random, it's a very important site. 
and it's also gravely endangered <laughs> by development. So glazing, glazing Southeast Asians adapted glazing at a very early stage of technological development. Like once again, the question of connections with China arises here. And that's what my student from, um, she did her a BA degree at the Beida in Beijing. Then she came to Singapore, did her PhD here. And she looked at the early, she came from the Changsha area, which was a Tang Dynasty Chinese pottery center. And she couldn't come up with a part conclusive. Uh, she did a very different, interesting PhD, and you should read it, basically. But she said there obviously was some kind of communication, but it was not direct transfer. Chinese potters didn't move to Cambodia. Cambodian potters didn't go to China. And so how did this information about glazing travel? Anyway, glazing is a separate technique that, that is very specialized in very few places in the world. Cambodia is probably the second place, unless you include Vietnam, but Vietnam was part of China at the time. So we should leave Vietnam out of that. Uh, kilns, kiln development is one of the most uh, visible ways of, uh, and uh, easy um, uh, ways of studying this early development technology. It's similar, but um, not the same as metal technology, obviously, even though it involves high temperature. Um, kiln development at Tongyek may have begun as early as the 5th, 6th century, which would make it by far the oldest known kiln site out of the Chinese zone. But kilns can be either very complex, like this one in the upper left, they can be very simple as well. Um, there are many types of kilns, but the two basic ones are shown at the lower left here. One is the updraft, where the hot air just goes straight up, more or less. So you have a kind of horizontal floor with a chimney going straight up in the air. But this is not very efficient, and it's not very easy to control. Uh, a bit more complex, but uh, much more sophisticated is the cross-draft kiln, where the fire goes through horizontally, through the firing chamber, across the pots, and then goes up into the air. Now, of course, fire wants to go up into the air. Hot air wants to rise. But if you prevent it from rising, uh, and, and then create a chimney of a certain height, you can actually create a kind of a, a um, a venturi effect, they call it, which makes the air flow faster. You don't have to sit there and fan the fire. In other words, you don't have to sit there with bellows like a blacksmith does who's making an iron or a copper tool. You just let natural um, physics take over, and it will actually force the air to flow at a faster rate to get through the narrow opening to get out again. And at some stage, the Southeast Asians developed this cross-draft kiln technique. So it's very important, but there are lots of uh, ways that you can build a cross-draft hill as well. And Southeast Asians had some very interesting, unique um, uh, ways of doing that. Now, some of the oldest pottery we know was made in a kiln in Southeast Asia is the so-called Pimai blackware. Some has been found in Ankorbore, also in Cam southeastern Cambodia, uh, not too far from the Tonyak site. Others uh, has been found in uh, Northeast Thailand, in the Pimai area. And uh, um, at least one kiln for this has been discovered on Bangong Hin, I think is the name of the site there. Um, there was a paper presented about this just in the conference we ran in Thailand last month, that's not the spot for a conference on archaeology. So they have developed, they have found a, a real kiln in, uh, in Thailand, which is used for making this. And that may be what, uh, similar to what the Cholmiak site was originally developed for, was making this kind of ware. So it's one of the first styles of pottery we know of in Southeast Asia, which had a regional significance, a regional distribution. Then it goes back to about the fifth century again. Now, mainland Southeast Asia is uh, the only part of Southeast Asia where glazing ever became significant. After Cambodia, well, maybe even um, during around the same time, it was also found in Northeast Thailand. Uh, eventually moved into Myanmar as well. But there is no glazing, or almost none, in the island Southeast Asia ever. They always made earthenware, lower fired pottery. Then it developed its own styles, very complex styles, or by different, diff very different techniques from those used on the mainland, where the mainland mainly used things like cord marking, as we call it, where you impress the surface of the wet clay with a paddle with this twine or some other kind of cord. In the island Southeast Asia, they mainly used carved wood to make stamp decorations. Now, these are decorations from well, Kalanai, which is in central 
um, Philippines. Um, again, the pottery there seems to go back about 4,000 years, about as early as it was in uh, Vietnam, but very different styles, very different uh, kinds of decorations applied to it, or different techniques. Um, and this, it was this type of pottery that, which was taken more or less uh, in the same styles from Southeast Asia into the Pacific. It became the basis of Lapita style pottery, the only type of pottery which has ever made in Polynesia. The early Polynesians did make pottery, and they, this is one of the forms of evidence which shows the early connections with Eastern Indonesia, which um, so far has been very little exploited by Southeast Asian archaeologists. And this compares Lapita and Kalanai. This Lapita is the name for the early Polynesian styles of pottery. Now, shipwrecks uh, have been a major recent addition to our our array of data about early Southeast Asian pottery. Um, even if the, the ships have large quantities of Chinese ceramics for export, and we often find that the um, pottery used by the sailors was made in Southeast Asia, indicating that the sailors were probably of Southeast Asian origin in the most part for these uh, sites. The uh, Chinese only seem to have begun actually a voyage in. The oldest known uh, Chinese shipwreck in Southeast Asia only dates from around 1500. So before that time, there were Chinese visitors to Southeast Asia, but they were traveling mostly on Southeast Asian ships. Uh, this is a, just a close up of one of these pots from one of the uh, shipwrecks. In the, um, this is in the Java Sea. Um, this is a typical uh, um, carved paddle and pressed pot, probably used by the crew. So there were connections with China, but for the most part, the styles of local pottery in Southeast Asia are very specific. Um, and, um, there's a two, there's a dichotomy between mainland and islands, but within those areas, there is a lot more variation, which so far as part of, there's been very little comparative study of that. Now, there's another type of pottery. This is actually from the Kodachina site in Northeast Sumatra, where I did my PhD, and you can get my PhD on Kodachina and also Edwards McKinnon's from our uh, Archaeological Union's website. And we, are, we have posted a number of PhDs there on, on poverty. And um, um, some believe that this style of um, carved, uh, no, sorry, about pottery, this red slipped cooking ware, and these are cross sections of those rims, very distinctive. Some believe that this is very similar to what one finds in South India around the same time, 12th, 13th centuries. But whether or not this is an important technique or an important design from South India, or whether it is related to more earlier types of Southeast Asian pottery, you cannot say. In my own opinion is it is Southeast Asian. But Ed McKinnon, my good friend, uh, who I'm, I've worked together for, with for over 30 years, thinks is Indian. So both um, opinions are still tenable. So um, another way we can look at South ceramics in Southeast Asian context is through the trade and communication lens. Um, we know that um, there was an uh, important trade passage in the Singapore area, including ceramics going all the way from southern China, uh, Guangzhou, through the Straits of Malacca to India, and all the way to the Persian Gulf, already by prehistoric times. Some Southeast Asian spices have been found in ancient uh, Egyptian tombs. So we know that things like cinnamon and cloves were reaching all the way to Africa in prehistoric era. By the time the Greeks and the Romans become aware of this, by about 2,000 years ago, around the time of Augustus Caesar, um, they mentioned that there are already large cargoes coming from Southeast Asia all the way to the Mediterranean, um, carrying um, large quantities of spices. And we know that in India, there are many, many Roman coins, a few. Roman artifacts have been discovered in Southeast Asia, including in southern Vietnam and in Thailand. So the study of pottery is one of the ways in which this traffic can be illuminated. We have discovered these are the oldest known Chinese shirts found in Southeast Asia. They're not glazed, as you can see. Um, they're from the Western Han Dynasty. And these were found in peninsular uh, Thailand, Khao San Peo site. And, and the Western Han, that was from, say, 206 BC to 1220 AD. And um, 
So these date from sometime in that period. In other words, from the late uh, centuries BCE, which is often known as the Dome Sohn era, because it's the time when these large Dome Sohn drums also were being made and uh, transported around Southeast Asia. But so far, the only known Chinese shirts of this era have been found in southern Thailand. Of course, we know very few sites of this period. Maybe if we discover more, we may find more of these. But so far, they are the only known examples. Now, there have been some other Han period ceramics, about 2,000 years old, um, which have been claimed to have been discovered in Southeast Asia. But, this is back in the 1930s. They were not discovered by archaeologists. They were purchased by the Dutch curator of the National Museum in Jakarta, or sorry to Flinders, and they were told, he was told that they came from places like Kerinci. This one here, he was told it came from Sumatra, and so he bought it. And so there, now people think that probably the dealers just sold them to him and told them that they were from Indonesia, so he would buy them, because otherwise he wouldn't. We've never found any of this Han dynasty where in an archaeological site yet in Indonesia. So I think it's highly dubious that they actually came from Sumatra or Indonesia. What we have found are Indian shirts. A very specific type, which is even a better indication of the global, well, the semi-global nature of Indian Ocean trade in late prehistoric times. Um, this is a shirt, upper right, found on the north coast of Bali. And that's the site at lower left. This is the north coast of Bali. That's the, the beach from which all these shirts of 2,000-year-old pottery are eroding away. It's a Birat site. And that at the lower right is a drawing of what the intact pot uh, would have looked like. It's called Romano Indian Rouletted Ware, a very complex term. So rouletting means this technique of making this repetitive decoration. You see, it goes around the base of the pot. That's by using a kind of a wheel <coughs> to roll it around. So roulette here doesn't mean gambling on a roulette wheel. It means rolling something around, like a little ball in <laughs> a wheel. Now, that means rolling it around. This is a very Roman technique. During the Roman Empire period, Augustus Caesar period, that's what the Roman pottery looked like. But this is called Romano Indian because this is an Indian imitation made in Narika Medu, Madras area, southeast India, around the first century, well, first century BCE, first century AD. So the Indians were imitating Roman pottery technique, <laughs> exporting it to Indonesia 2,000 years ago. It was being buried in sites in Bali. That indicates how you know, pottery can illuminate very widespread types of commercial processes with this period. Um, this is the same period as we get, say, a, a Roman lamp at the Pontic site in Thailand, and we get this ivory comb. A very similar ivory comb to that has been found in the ashes of Mount Vesuvius in Pompeii. So um, well, we know that uh, the various Roman authors did write about Southeast Asia in, uh, in the first, second century of AD, so they were aware of it. And this is an example of one of these reconstructed Romano Indian pots. Now, this is a almost contemporary pot, but it was made in South Vietnam. And this is the oldest, uh, it's from the oldest known shipwreck in Southeast Asia. Uh, it was about carbon dated to between 260 and 430. Um, and it was found in Malaysia, and this is the Han. A place called Pontian. And so the ship itself, um, we're not quite sure where it was made. It was made somewhere in Southeast Asia. It was carrying pottery from South Vietnam, a type which is uh, found in the Ao site, for example. It was in the Malay Peninsula. 